Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and, uh, and I hope uh, you find this interesting. As Subhash in indicated, I co-direct a program on the science and policy of global change at MIT, uh, looking broadly at issues of climate and environmental change. Uh, this, what I'm mainly going to talk about today is, as, as was indicated, a study we collaborated with with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, a federal agency, a federal laboratory in the, in the U.S. Um, so this study, uh, high penetration of renewable energy, uh, possible scenarios, implications, and best practices, took account of international experience as well as what was happening in the U.S. Uh, it was a large study, as you can see, with the list of uh, just the very lead authors on it. Uh, there was actually many other teams of researchers involved. So uh, you'll have to pardon me if I don't know every detail of the study uh, as we go forward. But I want to do some highlight uh, of some of the issues. When it was started, the kind of the uh, Department of Energy came to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and really s said to this team, let's just look at scenar a scenario where renewables are really, really a big part of the U.S. energy system and use the metaphor of let's kind of fly the plane until the wings fall off. So if we push renewables to this high level, what sort of problems might occur as a kind of a strategy for saying, well, if we understand what the problems are, then we can kind of work towards solutions and more R&D to find out where things are and just see, to see how th f things could go. So this target of 80% of all of U.S. energy being supplied by renewable energy uh, became kind of the lead uh, scenario. There were other scenarios with lower levels of renewables, but I want to focus mo mainly on that. Um, so what is the, uh, uh, what are the uh, renewable energy futures motivation? Again, to look at uh, the current generation of, uh, of, of uh, mix in the United States is mostly coal, natural gas, a little bit of oil. Most of that 25% natural gas and oil is really, is really natural gas. Nuclear has a big chunk, hydropower, but really the options for increasing renewables are more in wind, geothermal, uh, photovoltaic, or solar of some sort, and possibly biomass. So you see that's really, at this point, a really quite a small share of the uh, U.S. energy supply. So expanding that to up to 80 percent is a huge transformation of the system. Um, what are some of the challenges for intermittent renewables? Well, wind and solar, some of the you know, most abundant sources in some respects, are not in the electricity world dispatchable. You can't turn them on when you need them and turn them off when you don't need them. The wind blows or the sun shines on its own schedule, not necessarily the schedule in which you need energy. Uh, uh, so the question then is intermittency well-timed with demand if uh, both seasonally and daily, uh, if, it, if, 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 it, if the wind is blowing just when you need electricity, then you're lucky. Uh, if it's not, then not so much. And then there is the question of is supply predictable? So that also poses a challenge for the electricity system. Uh, even if it's intermittent, if you know exactly when it's happening, then you can gear up with other power generation to kind of fill in or not. But there's supply predictability at weekly, hourly, and even uh, minutes to seconds elements that are important. Uh, and is supply where you need it. Uh, you know, when you build a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant, you can build it close to where you want to use it. Uh, wind and solar, the resources are best in particular places, not necessarily where uh, demand is. So that becomes a turn. And then there is a question of the large area footprint that's really required. Uh, are there objections to siting in some of the places uh, where you might want to put windmills? Do they obscure, obscure a nice mountain view? Uh, you know, uh, you know there, was, there had been a big uh, wind farm planned for off the coast of uh, of uh, Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard in, uh, in Boston, and that's been objected to by wealthy landowners on the, on the thing because they don't want to see windmills sitting, sitting out there and obscuring their view. So there are issues that ar arise from it. Um, this is some work that we've done, not part of that study, but uh, part of work we've done in the, in the program I run, and it's axing, uh, uh, it looks at the medium power, this left side looking at the medium uh, power density, and you see this very dense amount of wind power uh, here, uh, not so much in these areas, a considerable bit offshore. But then this is uh, the degree of anti-coincidence. And you want anti-coincidence because 
if uh, one site it's blowing and the other site it's not, then you can balance out, right? So it's not blowing where, in one place, but if you have a windmill somewhere else, it, uh, it, uh, it, um, it balances out. But unfortunately, while this wind, there's a lot of wind here when it's blowing, uh, this is very coincident. It's either blowing or not blowing over this whole chunk of the thing, oftentimes. And so you can't then balance out, it, it means you can't balance out the wind uh, in one place uh, because you have a windmill someplace else. Uh, in, in, in that region. So it's kind of an odd, uh, poor fact that the wind is blowing a lot in these central parts, but then it also stops at the same time. Um, then uh, this is, uh, uh, and then you can get this sort of effect. This is some example from California. Uh, this is, oops, uh, wind over the course of a, of a day, a particular day, and uh, everything again is shutting down uh, even if you have these diverse locations, it all shuts down in, from 10 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's some of the highest demand periods for electricity, so the wind is blowing at night just when you don't particularly need it. So that poses a challenge that you have to do something with. Um, and then this is an example just for the United States of the blues are where the wind is, uh, the reds are where the load centers are. So uh, again, a lot of wind here, uh, not net, uh, but demand centers along the east coast, uh, west coast, south, not where the wind is. So that creates a need for transmission. Um, and then this is, uh, oh, I guess I, I, I think I showed this before, this degree of anti-coincidence here. This is the same figure as before, but now this is showing then uh, another way of looking at on the right side, the fraction of grid points in the Midwest with power for over the course of one year, hour by hour. And you see these disturbing points here uh, where nothing, no, nothing in that whole area is blowing. So that means you need, uh, you know, and, and fortunately, this is, if you know, this starts in January 1, this is like in August. And so that's when in the United States, uh, with a lot of uh, cooling demand for air conditioning, uh, just when your po peak power is peaking, you're, not, you're having these days where nothing is there. So you have to have storage equal to entire demand or some backup capacity to make it work. Uh, and then this is just looking at U.S. wind available episode length. Uh, 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 generally speaking, where wind is available corresponds where continuous episodes are prolonged. Uh, so you have Availability here uh, is, um, you know, strong again in terms of hours with high power density in this central part, but also offshore. Wind episodes, uh, again, longer episodes. Oops, in in this in the central portion, but particularly offshore. So the offshore wind uh, is potentially the the best source from that standpoint, but then it requires this building of fairly more expensive capacity to get windmills out, you know, off in the, in the ocean, more difficult and costly than doing it on land. Here then is a, actually an example from, uh, uh, from uh, Canada, uh, uh, Alberta, and, you know, and, and, and it is kind of a hit or miss. This was a day when, coincidentally, wind was well-timed with demand. This is a day when it was completely off. So you face those sorts of challenges uh, with it. Um, this is again a solar, this is an example of solar. Now, uh, if you're in a sunny place, I think this is somewhere in the desert southwest of the United States, uh, there it's very predictable and very steady. You know exactly when it's gonna happen as long as you don't have clouds, but you get, uh, it's, 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 more, it's in general more regular, but again, there are issues of just peaking it when, when, you, when, when you need it. So uh, how, do you, how, how do you make use of it? Well, you might hope to choose anti-coincidence sites. Larger area grid interconnects can help you with that. Uh, uh, you can balance anti-coincident renewables, some hope of balancing wind and solar or bring in some hydro at the right amount of time. Uh, you can build excess capacity at high supply and low demand periods. Uh, and, and spill excess. So uh, sometimes you'll just have excess capacity 
uh, in the spring when wind, there's a lot of wind or at night, uh, you just don't need it. You kind of, it spins away but doesn't produce any electricity. Uh, that, you know, is a way to make it work. It's just then you have capacity that you built at some cost that isn't producing anything. So that raises the cost. Uh, you can balance with dispatchable renewables such as hydro or geothermal or biomass, uh, storage, uh, pumped hydro, compressed air, battery storage. Again, these end up being fairly expensive uh, uh, and, and in the study I'll talk about didn't come in uh, that strongly. Uh, you can balance with dispatchable generation such as a natural gas turbine or a combined cycle. So uh, that's, that's another sort of option of looking at it. Then of course you're having that plant not operating a lot of the time, so you can do that, but it can increase the cost because you're having extra capital sitting around um, uh, not, not being utilized. And then you can try to ramp baseload coal or nuclear. They can't be flexed really quickly, so it is, does require some predictability of what's going to happen, but they can be ramped up, up and down potentially. Um, then this is going to be really, um, this is kind of small, I don't know how much you can see, but I want to focus on a couple of things, if you just look at total capital costs there, uh, wind kind of beats coal. Uh, that's a, under $2,000 per uh, kilowatt hour installed capacity, where coal is somewhat over 2000 So that looks cheaper from that standpoint. Uh, but then we have this issue, because it's not blowing all the time, uh, the capacity factor for wind, we estimated here 35%. That's actually a bit higher than we often achieve. Whereas pulverized coal, you can operate 85% of the time, pretty much. Uh, so you have low overnight capital costs, but then the return is spread over fewer kilowatts because you produce kilowatt hours because you can't produce as often. So then, as a result, the capital recovery per kilowatt hour turns out to be somewhat more costly, seven cents rather than three cents. Um, but uh, but you have no fuel costs, so that's an advantage, of course, with it. But we ended up coming up with. Our bottom line, this was based on some earlier DOE studies as well, that it's still 43% more expensive than the markup over coal. That's on this levelized cost sort of basis. But then you can't be sure when it's going to blow. So one way to think about that is uh, here we assume what if you have to have a backup for 100% of the, of, the, of the wind because uh, 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 we saw those days when just none of it is blowing over a whole chunk of the country. Then you get this, uh, you have a backup, we assume natural gas or biomass here, ready to operate, but it needs to operate rarely. Uh, so it has a low fuel cost because you're not running it very much, but you do have uh, then higher capital costs uh, because now you have not only the wind power, which isn't operating, 30, it's only operating 35% of the time, but you have this natural gas plant or a biomass plant sitting around most of the year waiting for the few days or weeks when it needs to operate. So that ends up uh, pushing up the cost again uh, to like in this case uh, you know 10 cents uh, for wind with gas back up up to almost 20 cents if you do it with biomass. So that's some of the challenges that uh, renewables face. Of course we hope some of these costs will come down in the future uh, but, uh, but that's, that's some of the, I wanted to kind of highlight some of those. So there's renewable electricity future study you know, is taking account of lots of those sorts of things, saying if we want to do all this, if we try to fit all these things together, if we want to optimize the system using a model that kind of takes account of what's really, how wind is really blowing, when it's blowing, what demand uh, curves look like over the day and year, uh, can we fit all these things together in a way that kind of makes the whole system work? So that's the, so that's, uh, that's, that's the goal. Um, uh, it, we, we were trying to do some things. We were exploring a select number of scenarios, a variety of renewable generation scenarios, identify electric sector characteristics of high levels of renewables. Uh, it isn't doing everything. We're not considering the policies or new operating procedures that would need to involve, that would need to be developed. Uh, you know, just the business model that would make it work. Who owns it? How does it fit in? Who gets paid for what? There's a question of if you have to have excess capacity sitting around, who gets paid for that is how does that work? If you have a market operating where when you really need that capacity, uh, prices can shoot up and they shoot up really high, then you can kind of imp implicitly fund that, but oftentimes we have some caps on what those prices are. So issues of that were really not part of it. 
uh, to look at. So it's, it's, a, it's a first study, as I said, attempt to look at uh, this, um, this, uh, this first look at if you really tried to do it big in the United States, what it would look like. So there are a set of models that were used in it. Uh, the core model is this REEDS model, a renewable energy deployment model, which does model all uh, the whole power sector, both coal, nuclear, and renewables. Uh, uh, and then, um, so that uh, has a fair amount of resolution, but it doesn't get really down to the hourly grid uh, thing. So this grid view model gets down to that. There is issues of getting even down lower to kind of modeling it minute by minute or second by second. So, so, that, so we didn't get quite that far down. And then it's looking at capacity and generation. We're looking at some of the implications for GHG emissions, water use, land use, uh, and direct costs. Uh, again, there was a huge number of people involved in it. This Black and Veatch did most of the cost and performance studies. There were technology teams looking at the potential for cost to fall, uh, uh, a variety of different uh, elements looking at, you know, could we have flexible demand? Could we shift demand around a bit in time uh, to do it? This modeling system helped us to bring that all together. Um, so this is kind of a bit of the scenario framework. As I said, a lot of the focus on is 80% renewable. There were other scenarios. I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, these and that there's one that says uh, uh, no technology improvement, uh, basically technology as it exists. There was a study with incremental technology improvement and then there was one with uh, a more a larger, what if, what if the technology for these things uh, increased further. And then there was an interesting a question of asking um, what if you could do uh, what if you could just, this, these were initially, was, what if you just could, um, uh, if you needed transmission capacity, you would build it. But building transmission capacity can be difficult. You have to get the siting, you have to get approval. Who is going to do that? That's another issue. So we did one where there was constrained transmission. We really stuck with mostly the own, the existing long scale transmission lines you had. Uh, constrained flexibility. What if you couldn't? Uh, adjust things as quickly, and then constrained resources. What if some of these renewable sources that we thought are out there were just not going to be available because people, they were difficult to cite? Um, so, uh, so those are some of the, there's also uh, alternative fossil baselines where higher fossil fuel costs, lower fossil fuel costs, higher fossil, uh, 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 and then a high demand and a, and a high demand with the 80% renewable. So, the base demand study is, is uh, showing uh, well here, uh, the base demand scenario was showing very little growth in demand, you know, about flat for overall electricity demand. The high demand study uh, uh, has kind of more like a, a linear growth like we'd ex seen in, in most of the, through the last few decades. Um, you know, I think most of the projections for the U.S. suggest something closer to the low demand study, but we wanted to see if that wasn't true, whether uh, things would, uh, whether renewables could still supply uh, that level. Um, uh, so you can see some of the other things. There is some shift of transportation towards electricity, uh, and so that was uh, uh, an element, uh, not a big deal, uh, grid flexibility, um, most assumed electricity enhance the flexibility. Uh, transmission, most of them allowed transmission siting and permitting. Most scenarios assumed project siting regimes that allowed renewable development, except for those constrained ones. So the constrained scenarios were largely uh, op offshoots of this. So this is, uh, NRELS uh, does a lot of work on what a renewable resources look like. And these are just what some of them are and what some of their regional uh, 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 capacity looks like. So you see that the solar, uh, particularly uh, 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 solar, is, is of course heavily, uh, the, the, the resources are strongly down here in the desert southwest where the sun, you know, it's not cloudy very often and you have intense sun, weaker as you move into the north and, and east, east because it's cloudy, uh, a lot because of the cloudiness in the Pacific Northwest or here. Uh, geothermal tends to be out in the west where these 
you know, where you have more of this uh, tectonic plate movement and volcanic activity, so you have things near the surface. Uh, wind, uh, again, this big blob in the center of the country, some into this area, and a lot of offshore. Uh, hydropower, this was additional hydropower, and we were really just not looking at building big new dams, but really run of the river hydropower that, that uh, because no one really thinks the U.S. is going to build any big dams, there's not that much capacity, but there's some run of the river capacity. And then uh, this is uh, an estimate of biopower, uh, uh, really where biomass productivity uh, exists and you have land where you could grow it. So the center of the country, the south, southern part of the country, up in Maine and then the, the west. <clears throat> um, altogether, the estimates are like 1,000 gigawatts of, of power capacity, that's massive. Uh, you know, I think all of nuclear capacity in the United States is about 100 gigawatts. Uh, total capacity is, I think, probably less than 500 gigawatts. So this is uh, more than twice as much uh, as the uh, power that the U.S. uses. Uh, well, this is gigawatts of installed. If you, if you produced it over a year, uh, you, could, you would get, uh, uh, oh, well, current total of U.S. installed capacity well, is 1,000 gigawatts. Um, I'm sorry, I got this, I, I, I'm mixed up here. This is, the gigawatts of, 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 of actual renewables are massively bigger than that, solar 80,000 gigawatts. So many, many times the uh, current installed capacity in the U.S. So that, isn't a, that itself isn't a limit on, on what, uh, what you could do. So what are some of the key results? Um, it is a transformation of the electricity system. Uh, this is where the these, those are fossil and nuclear power plants. So currently, most of the power is from that, from there. There are some wind plants existing here. Uh, there is a lot of hydropower in the, in different parts of the country, but not much of any of the PV, CSP, biopower, or or wind. Uh, this is the 2050 story. So much of that fossil is going away. Uh, wind through a big chunk of the country here, uh, more. Uh, uh, Solar, as you might expect, over here, but also in these areas. And so the solar capacity isn't as effective out here, but this is, you'll see in a few slides that that's really coming in as part of the balancing of, 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 of the wind. Um, so on the top, this is, uh, this is the 80% the, the renewable uh, in the incremental technology scenarios. And you can see that even though demand for electricity isn't increasing, it means an awful lot of increased installed capacity because this stuff isn't operating at 85% of capacity like existing, well, much of existing fossil is. We're seeing you know, nuclear kind of under assumption kind of stays where it is. Coal is going down quite a lot. Natural gas is still in to some degree, but then we see a large mix of, 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 uh, of uh, of renewable technologies, and part of the story is, is that if you if you kind of do a whole bunch of them, they're kind of balancing each other out to some degree. So that's part of the big optimization problem of just you want to make this all balanced. How do you make it work? Uh, and then uh, uh, this is just showing the percent uh, of renewables instead of uh, this kind of just absolute capacity. Uh, here's then the uh, the production, uh, the electricity production scenario. And that's going to look somewhat different than the, uh, than the installed capacity because some of these power sources operate at greater capacity than others. So that gives you kind of a picture of just what's happening. I think a lot of wind, that becomes an important source, but then a, a large mix of, of everything uh, mixes into this economically optimal strategy. Um, uh, the abundance and diversity of real renewable can support multiple combinations of RE technologies. So we did, you know, different, here's the low demand and the high demand, changes the mix of things under the high demand. Uh, wind goes up a little bit, but we get a lot more solar PV, uh, not so much difference in the other ones. These ranges are because we did a lot of, of different scenarios with the low demand studies. Uh, here's the technology, the different, um, uh, uh, let's see, what's this? Well, this is percent. This is just the installed capacity and this is percent of generation. So just two looks at it. 
So, um, uh, and constraints on uh, to transmission result in greater PV, uh, so that's uh, an offshore wind and biopower. That's because uh, when we constrain capacity, all that wind in the center of the country can't uh, constrain uh, transmission, can't get to the demand centers. So you focus more on some of this offshore wind and, uh, and desert southwest um, uh, solar to provide power to, uh, to uh, the west coast. Um, okay, so I think that's the main story there. Uh, this is just to say that there is a kind of a, a, a regional mix of things. Uh, there is electricity flowing across regions. So you see some regions are, uh, D Texas has demand quite a lot more than the actual uh, 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 generation uh, it has. So it's importing. Uh, the central part of the country is, uh, is, is exporting. Uh, Florida is an importer. Um, the Great Plains, massive exporters, so that's that wind. So it does require, it would require quite a lot of flow of electricity across uh, the country uh, in different ways to make use of this varied resource that varies across the, uh, across the country. Um, a more flexible electric power system is needed to enable this. Uh, uh, we need to have flexible generators, particularly natural gas, dispatchable renewables are an important component of it. Um, demand response, interruptible load, controlled charging of electric vehicles. One of the possibilities, if you have a lot, a lot of electric vehicles, they may act as, uh, you know, the, if you can control those from the utility, either charging or discharging, you can kind of meet some of the electricity uh, uh, system's needs. Um, of course, there's a challenge is how people are going to use them. Uh, and not, uh, and there's issues with that and just the current batteries don't do well if you recharge and discharge them. So that's an improvement that needs to be made. Uh, and then you have to think about how you're going to, how the utilities that can control that or who's going to control that, uh, that system. Uh, storage, containment, transmission, uh, geospatial diversity, coordinating bulk power. So there's a lot that has to happen in order to make this work. Uh, and I know some of our colleagues here at Polytechnic University into optimizing, uh, optimizing systems. This is a major optimization problem in order to kind of just figure out how to make all those moving parts work together. So there are challenges of this. And as we said, we didn't really look at the institutional issues that would need to be done to actually make all these things work. So that, that just, you know, what sort of market incentives or institutions need to be developed to make all this work and make sure it's all integrated is, a, is a, another challenge. So this is, this is just then showing how this is this sort of important story that you have, um, you have a, uh, this is a peak demand period uh, in July uh, in a particular, uh, I guess this is for the country, uh, and it shows this daily peaks uh, as, you know, the day warms up and you're turning on air conditioning. This is how it's met uh, now. This is an off-peak story. And this is how it's met now. And then this is how it's met uh, with this uh, in these in the in this 80% renewable. This is the incremental technology scenario. So you see, you are getting you know a huge mix of things happening. Uh, this solar PV coming in at a particular point, helping to get that out. There's still some wind there, but you have to ramp up some of these things and ramp them down. Coal is not just this big easy blob. It's moving around a lot. Uh, uh, so you get a lot of, you can just imagine the kind of complexity of getting all that to work. And then here it is in the off-peak. And I guess the interesting thing to show there is, here is this gray is, that is this uh, spilled wind. So that's, you have wind power, uh, it's blowing, but you have nothing to use it, so you just kind of disconnect it from the generation and just let it spin away. So those things, of course, to get, if you're building windmills and you're not getting paid during that point, that kind of increases the cost uh, you're going to expect when you uh, need to do it in other ways. This is just the uh, different scenario. This is the enhanced technology scenario, more rapid scenario. It, it, I don't know that there's a lot to say about this picture. It's obviously somewhat different. Uh, uh, and this is then the constrained transmission scenario, giving still a different picture, again, then with even, I think, more of the spillage. Um, so, you know, the picture can look quite different depending on what you actually think you're solving these problems. 
So, uh, and then this is just showing you kind of uh, under uh, uh, a couple of uh, 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 so this is the current uh, situation. How we move, how we ramp or bring in and out uh, some of the uh, different uh, main fossil technologies. Coal again being a base load uh, is relatively flat. You know, gas combined cycle is doing some of the intermediate ramping, and then gas uh, turbine is just is doing more of it. And you see this gets more peaked. I mean, coal is a dramatic change here. Uh, there's some questions of what that does to coal lifetime of plants if you have to ramp it that often. There's some issues there. Uh, the gas combined cycle is, is sharper peaks, and you see you know, quicker turns in it, and here similarly in the gas. So those all present some challenges for uh, you know, moving much quicker and, 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 and spinning on a dime, whereas before we were able to spin on a quarter, let's say. Um, this is uh, uh, storage uh, at high net load, uh, shift, trying to shift the load. Uh, what, well, what the net load looks like after you um, take in uh, wind and solar. So uh, the, the load starts out. Uh, uh, this is the, the uh, central solar power. And you're seeing these uh, shifts of the net load after this uh, looks like this. So it's, uh, in some cases, peaking out more uh, and getting sharper drops. Uh, but it doesn't change a whole lot from what the net load looks like without that. But you can see how it's fitting together. Then this was this, uh, this is a fair amount of transmission uh, needed to be built in the unconstrained transmission scenario. Not as much as we originally imagined. Uh, it isn't you know, that dramatic an increase, but it does require some key linkages across the country uh, to kind of move power where you don't have a lot of connectivity now. You are moving some of this power probably all the way over to the coast, but there already is a fairly dense uh, uh, distribution system existing here, not so dense moving these parts apart. But even in this constrained emission scenario where we built very few things, we were able to meet uh, demand. It's just that uh, then you had to rely on these, you know, it's constrained optimization, so uh, it's going to be more expensive. You're not doing the, just, the, just the cheapest things as you go around. And this is then the constrained emission scenario. Here again, you're seeing, you know, now Texas is meeting its demand. Uh, now the Great Plains are still an exporter, but not as big an exporter. Uh, you know, Florida is still uh, not quite meeting its generation. So you're just seeing less of the transmission, less of the, of the imbalance of demand and supply in different regions. Regions have to be more self-sufficient. Um, this is just, again, some of the examples of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, variable generation. So we, this is 80% renewable. But it's important to say that the wind and solar are the variables, so they are only accounting for 43% of the generation in the in the uh, in this in this case. You know, depending on where you, which of these other scenarios you look at, that goes up or down. And then the new transmission miles uh, up a lot if you have higher demand, obviously, uh, or constrained resources, but down if we're under these constrained transmission. So you kind of see, you know, these different elements of, uh, of, um, of things, uh, you know, changing depending on what sort of constraints you might have in the system. This curtailment thing, that's kind of an interesting story. That's this, you know, windmills turning away, but no one needing the power. So 5.6% of the variable generation uh, was, you know, spilled. Uh, it goes up to 8.6% in this constrained emissions. Uh, up 7% and constrained. So basically all of these things are ending up at uh, rise, raising that spilled, uh, spilled uh, amount of electricity. Um, this is just, uh, uh, we, we do get deep reductions in CO2 emissions uh, here, and this is the, uh, and, uh, uh, and water, water use. So those are environmental benefits of this problem. Again, we said, this isn't a cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth it? Is it not? But these are some of the benefits. There are also reduced uh, air pollution uh, from this scenario. And then this is the uh, 
this is kind of the uh, estimates of, of, uh, of changes in cost uh, uh, per megawatt hour, so the increase uh, in cost. So, uh, current, so 2010 is zero because that's the base, but we're seeing we're increasing the cost from you know, 24, 25 to up to about 45 or 50 uh, dollars per megawatt hour in this scenario. Um, these other scenarios are forecast by the Energy, Energy Information Administration, and this was a forecast done by the EPA that was a study that was going to meet uh, a 50 percent, or I think the, the Waxman-Markey bill on carbon emissions. And so the point was, uh, yes, this is going to increase the cost of electricity, but not that much more than some other studies that have looked at if we were to meet, um, if we were to meet our lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so, uh, so that was kind of the bottom cost line. Um, so a lot of future work is needed. Um, this isn't a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis. It was an attempt to look at what some of the challenges were. Uh, we haven't looked at some of these market design institutions, other structural areas. I think that's really critical. Uh, uh, well, in some sense, if we expand the power system, some of these problems will emerge. <laughs> uh, some of them will, and hopefully they'll be solved one way or another. Uh, but it will require probably flexible, some more thinking about the regulatory structure that exists. Uh, and then, uh, you know, deeper d uh, analysis of advanced technologies, including supply and demand side flexibility. Now, we looked at some of these things like if you're, if you wanted to cool your house, might you have a big uh, freezer in your basement? So <laughs> when you have electricity at night, uh, you freeze a whole bunch of water in your basement. You have a system, and then uh, during the peak heat of the day, instead of using electricity, uh, you can kind of use that co cold, that ice to cool cool the house. So there are a variety of things you can do kind of storage. The storage is important on many different elements. I don't know how much of this came out, but you have this issue of, you know, storage during the day. You know, I showed that one early slide about wind blowing at night in California and not during the day. So there's that daily storage. But then we have this other big issue, particularly with wind, of a lot of wind in the uh, in the spring and in the fall, but demand being more really peaked in the summer or somewhat more in the winter. So that requires this very long-term storage, which I think is a bigger, bigger challenge. So that's, um, I think, all I had to say. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. But uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>